at the end of the day, the stuff that you think might be like super niche or super specific to you, a lot of the time, like, you know, humans are like similar, you know, we all are kind of going through this insane thing that is like existing, just kind of leaning into whatever's true to us and what's true to our stories and true to our lives, you know, like that's what is what's gonna is what we want to put out because that's what we know and that's what we're gonna make best welcome back to the corner talks podcast i have my good friend here how's it going man happy to be back no it shouldn't be about anything like this is yeah. one life yep. <laughs> one life like fucking yeah. do it my guy but if she just got it she totally understood it 20 years old when i started just watching a lot of movies how it, and it tells a story i want to tell a story Someone that I met at the Toronto International Film Festival years back. Uh, his name is Zach Goldstein. What's going on, buddy? How are you? I'm good, man. Good to see you. It's been a long time. You know, tip was a good time. Loved, uh, loved being there that year. Saw some good stuff. I think I saw Uncut Gems that year also, which was like pretty crazy. That was a pretty crazy. That's the last one I was at. I don't think they've been, have they been doing stuff since? Has there been like any of yeah. the movies? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up, actually. Uh, I, I very much miss Tiff. Uh, the last time we saw each other, it's definitely not functioning or operating the way uh, we last remember. Um, because I'm a volunteer, I still get emails to join, but it's not the same. Uh, it's uh, virtual. Yeah, it's not as immersive. Um, I think they were trying to do something uh, last year where it was like voluntary, like if you really wanted to. It was a select few that only got chosen. Um, to actually show up at the festival, but it was highly monitored, highly regulated. So I just didn't bother with it, um, okay. but not to the to the scale like we we last witnessed, right? Um, right. Just yeah. hundreds, thousands of people showing up, waiting in line for the premiere of Honey Boy, like we uh, <laughs> our, yeah. our group did. Um, that was a, that was an amazing time, right? A, a surreal yeah. experience, uh, something that we both wish uh, to live live again, right? Um, I'm yeah, hoping totally. that this year things will get better. Uh, what are your opinions on that? You think uh, in light of uh, not just like the industry, but in, in general, I think things will get better. I mean, yeah, here's hoping like I'm out in, um, I haven't been in Toronto for a bit. I'm out in Rochester right now. Uh, oh, okay. Up, uh, my master's degree. Um, nice. And like that stuff, it's already started coming back here. Like there's a theater um, just by where I live. It's called the little, it's like this independent theater in Rochester. It's been here for like 90 years. And like last April, they started doing in-person stuff and like, they finally like have like uh, slowed, like uh, taken away some of the restrictions and like I'm there like a few times a week, every week. And like, they've got events going on. So like, I think hopefully in the near future, hopefully by this fall, you know, like we get festivals back again. And it seems like we're on that way. I mean, Rochester's not that far from Toronto. And so like, it seems like even here, like we're kind of getting our way back. Yeah. Slowly, slowly, but surely. Right. Um, it's yeah. just about uh, at this point adapting uh, to the new way of life. Um, I know people don't want to really hear that, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the cases are just, uh, I don't know, that's always, we're always going to have these waves uh, as long as we take the, the right uh, preemptive measures, right? Um, I think we'll be yeah, in I good mean, hands. It, yeah. Probably like won't be at full capacity. And like, I think that's okay. You know, just like accepting like smaller crowds and hopefully that's enough, you know? Yeah, for me, that's, uh, that is going to be hard to digest in a way. Like I, I personally wouldn't want to go up to, I, I avoid large venues if, if, even if they have them. But yeah. um, for someone, imagine someone like coming up, like, like, you know, in their teenage years, never been to like Toronto International Film Festival and yeah. was always curious about it, you know, and they go to an event and it's like half the capacity. People are wearing masks, can't talk, can't, you know, sanitize when you walk in. It's like they, they'll never experience what we experienced at Honey Boy premiere, you know? Yeah. Really, yeah, you know, really I mean, was like a networking event. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, anything really can be if you want it to, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It's, it's how you, it's how you make it as well. And I think I, that's what I meant by adaptability. Everyone will kind of find their way. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. But uh, that's great. So yeah, we met at the Toronto International Film Festival along with uh, your friend and close collaborator, Joey Lipback, yeah. uh, who I had on the podcast last. And uh, he had such great things to say about you, man. Um, oh, yeah. He spoke highly of you. Yeah. Your friendship, um, your creative uh, in inclination, uh, your talent. So um Really excited to have you on the podcast to discuss more about uh, this kind of collaboration and uh, really want to know uh, kind of beforehand, or maybe you already met him in the process. How did you become a filmmaker? What led to this uh, career path? I mean, honestly, like uh, it kind of all kind of started with Joey. Like uh, 
we grew up together. Like we live, we've lived on this, lived on the same street since we were kids, like uh, in Thornhill, you know, just like a suburb kind of near uh, Toronto. St. Elizabeth represent. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's where I went to high mom. school. That's what, yeah. that's what me and, me and my uh, joy were, were, uh, were kind of bonding on that uh, yeah. location. <laughs> that yeah, area. Oh, yeah, God, I love yeah. Yeah. I worked at, I worked at the Starbucks near there for, for a couple of years. Like uh, that, that area <laughs> promenade? is very near and dear to me. Yeah. Yeah. Promenade, yeah. Yeah. Man. Oh, promenade was our shit. Like we used to go yeah, all yeah. the time, our destination. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, lunches. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, totally. But yeah. So I, I grew up with Joey and like, I mean, I, I'd always like really, I'd been into movies, but like not in, in the way that I am now. Like, I don't think it, I would be like into filmmaking, let alone like into like movies as much as I am if it weren't for Joey. Like he, when we were in grade 11, we were in high school. Uh, he invited me to TIFF for the first time. I'd never been like, he'd been going for years as a kid, you know, with his dad, like Midnight Madness. And like, so uh, he invited me to see, I think we were 17 and he invited me to see uh, What We Do in the Shadows the uh oh yeah highly recommended uh yeah. from a lot of filmmakers yeah oh yeah and it, it was it was in right yeah 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 and yeah then, yeah jermaine clement was there also so we got to like meet yeah. them and like talk to them and that was just like a whole other world experience that just kind of like opened me up uh to like the the film world in a way that i don't think i had uh expected myself to and like just like throughout, um, you know, our undergrad, like we were in both at uh, University of Toronto and, uh, but like in different programs, like I'm actually like a classical musician. That's what I've been doing, uh, like my school in, like I did in my undergrad oh, okay. in like uh, clarinet, like classical clarinet nice. performance. I'm doing my master's in that as well right now. So like, oh, wow. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm I've never heard much... someone doing their master's in, in music, like close to me. I know people do it but yeah. <laughs> uh, in my yeah, circle. Yeah. That's amazing, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm at like the uh, Eastman School of Music down here, which is like uh, kind of like a center for a lot of uh, classical musicians, like pursuing like uh, orchestra, you know, related uh, playing. So like that's like a big uh, a part of, uh, you know, the arts that's like very near and dear to me that like I hope to like bring into uh, filmmaking. And I think and I this have... coincides also with your friendship with Joey Litvak, because yeah. he also mentioned that, you know, with his whole um you know, association with Corn Puffians and, you know, he has a uh, music talent, a musical talent as a filmmaker. You're yeah, saying totally. that that's your like first love. Like that's your, uh, yeah, like, that's where it's all like started there, yeah. for me. Yeah. Like I've, I've, nice. I've like music is like what I've, what I've been wanting to pursue my whole life. And, and I still do. Um, but I think that like, I want to use it in, in more unique ways, you know, and bring it into filmmaking. Cause like working with Joey, like, um, so like we, we had been, uh, he had, through our undergrad like we were I was saying we were different programs and so like we would have like a media club type thing where like every week or every couple of weeks like we'd meet up and we'd watch movies and I he just like give me movies to watch and kind of like giving me like uh, an education kind of like film school yeah an education oh, yeah, honestly like yeah. Joey's really like media club our media club which still continues like to this day you know we're in different cities now you know every week we're watching a movie or a show or something and like that's like what's really like he's educated me and like taken me to a place where like uh, you know, that I wanted, that I felt comfortable, like, getting involved in, you know, I'm not sure uh, how much he mentioned, but we, uh, we went on a birthright trip in 2019. Um, this was, I think this, uh, this I guess to this Israel, might, right? Yeah, to Israel. Yeah, yeah, the birthright trip. Yeah, okay. I yeah, heard of that so, with, with Canada, they, they grant you a, yeah, a trip to Israel. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you're for like people, uh, Jewish people between the age of like 18 and 25, um, they offer you like, uh, if you like, you can apply and they, uh, you for uh, like a free trip to Israel. That's know, amazing. To, to yeah. go and, and it's awesome. And so like, mm -hmm. uh, we use that trip to, you know, like we decided we wanted to make a movie on that trip. Oh, and that okay. was kind of like my first like step into it is as he always knew going into it that he wanted to make something. And then it wasn't until like we had started like, uh, you know, preparing for the trip that he brought up the idea. Like this was maybe a couple weeks before we, you know, left, he brought up the idea of, you know, like we didn't know what we were going to film. We didn't know what we were going to do, but um, we just kind of were like, let's we he had like a handheld jvc camera you know that um most of like uh the new movie that we've been working on for the last couple of years um i'm corn puffy and ghost camera like a lot of that movie was shot on this like same jvc like handheld camera and so we were just kind of going around like flying by the seat of our pants and like just writing as we went along like whatever we had to do on the trip we found a way to like write it in to um the, like right into the story of the movie and like what ended up happening on that trip is our uh all of our group's passports got stolen oh and my god so, <laughs> yeah yeah so they no. when you when you show up to israel like they uh 
the leaders of your group or your trip because you're in a group of like 40 people or something yeah they kind of collect all of our passports and keep them in a backpack because they thought you know like we're traveling every day we're in a new place like it's likely that someone might lose their passport like let's just like take get rid of that anxiety and just put it on one person who were like it's like europe like they do the same thing like kind of oh yeah yeah well like it's not advised and i wouldn't do it but i know like you can you know when i go on trips with like family or whatever it's like one person has it but yeah yeah yeah, back to your story i feel like (laughs) it's led to something tragic yeah so like we went and so one night like we we had a night out on the trip and you know like we're, we're still like filming stuff. Like this is on like the third day of the trip and it's a 10 day okay. trip. And we're still, we're just like kind of filming whatever we're doing, you know, there's no, no real like uh, thought out narrative or anything about what's going on. And uh, then like one night we go out and like, we get back on the bus to go back to our, like, uh, you know, where we're staying for that night. And like, there's just like panic because um, the person who was like in charge of it had like put the bag down for a second to like gather everybody just like in the city streets of like Tel Aviv. And he turned around to grab it and it was gone. And yeah, so you don't bag, do that. Like, yeah, yeah. With everyone's Fuck. stuff had been taken. And so we, yeah, so the movie became like, it was like, okay, <laughs> let's make, you know, a mockumentary about, you know, the, uh, a mockumentary. Joey and Zach, Far story. From Home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly. Yeah. So the, the movie's called, uh, it's called yeah. Birth Right, Birth Wrong. Oh, okay. That's uh, cool. And, uh, Play on words. You know, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, and it was funny because before we left, like we got on, on camera, Joey's brother, uh, he said, have a great trip, like, uh, on birthright, uh, you wouldn't want it to be birth wrong. And this was like before it had even happened. And so we found that footage and was like, okay, we've got a title. That's what it is. And that was really like my first step into it was, uh, was writing. And I was in it a lot. Like we, uh, mm-hmm. we wrote, we, it was mostly a lot of the, what I think Joey mentioned in his, uh, talk with you is like a lot of our like work and a lot of like what I've gotten really interested in is, you know, like blurring the lines of like reality and fiction and, right. uh, in in through like a comedic uh lens you know like i love nathan fielder so like i'd love nathan for you and like uh you know like how to with john wilson like sasha baron cohen like all the stuff he's been doing and like that's always been something that's been like super interesting. like that style you mean like the humor yeah yeah, yeah, yeah style okay. of, the style of humor and like kind of blurring like what's real what's not like like what's a character what isn't and so a Got lot it. of it was like just like just interacting with real people with like you know hitting certain beats and stuff and uh, I mean, yeah, that's like, that's kind of where like it stemmed for me was like getting a chance to, you know, we, we were writing, like we had a legal pad that we got at the Canadian embassy where we were uh, filling out all the paperwork to get like temporary passports and stuff. And like, we have this and we, and we had this legal pad that we just kept with us. And like, we just wrote throughout and like involved different people that were on the trip in the process, whoever wanted to be involved. And it came out to like about an hour long movie that like we were both really proud of and we spent the whole that rest of that summer we got back in june we spent the rest of that summer you know like editing finishing like writing narrations and stuff and it uh and it came together and it was it was an awesome time and like it just made me want to like keep doing it more that's amazing so that was your first kind of experience in the filmmaking process and it really is admirable like i i'm sure there's people listening to this um you know because we have in this business collaborators all the time but you have a friendship with this person oh yeah and, yeah joey like a very yeah. deep like like i love yeah. him like with everything in my heart yeah it's a brotherhood like, yeah it's a yeah, it, it's yeah. brotherly love man and, and i yeah. and i could see it and it's something that uh like i said again like i highly admire it's something that i always aspired to have like um a lot of my friends aren't really like i've made friends in the business but i don't have them from since i was a child um yeah so what i'm saying is like the fact that you guys not only are friends and you could uh you guys can create uh content to- together right produce films um and that must be an interesting experience how is that collaboration by the way are you is one headstrong one's more you know uh i i got to do it this way and you know not lenient or is (laughs) one takes care of this area of the film and one takes care of that how's that dynamic well it's like what's what's really great about like doing with a with someone like that's as close of a friend as joey is is that it's like a very safe place for for us to like experiment and bring things up like there's I'm never worried and he's never worried to like bring anything to me or say anything to me like it's a very open honest and like honestly like just the most fun and like creatively fulfilling and so I mean Joey as as I'm sure he's he's talked about um is uh you know he he definitely delves more into uh experimental style of filmmaking and it's very unique and uh very much leans in more of an avant-garde direction and like in a lot of stuff we've made I've found a lot of the time I kind of have to be the person that maybe 
you know, makes it a little bit more accessible. Um, and that's not to say that I don't love his art film and his, and the, and the stuff he does. And like, uh, I don't like, I don't know if you saw, but like his, uh, movies, Ice Sink and Atomatom had these short films that he made, um, like are very much like experimental and they've been doing well in festivals and stuff. And that's not to diminish that style of filmmaking at all, but like with what we make together, I think almost my like lack of knowledge in, uh, in that area kind of brings it down to a, a more accessible level sometimes mm -hmm. like, uh, over the summer, um, you know, I, uh, wrote like and directed and like started a, a sketch, uh, like a sketch comedy uh, video that I made for like this orchestra that I was a part of, uh, that I was playing for professionally over the summer. And I had to like, we were editing it and he wanted to put in like the, uh, like saving private Ryan, like, <laughs> like cut to black, like ears ringing, like, and okay. it, it, the, the premise of the video is that like, um, you know, they asked us to like do a day in the life video of the musicians of the orchestra. And um, I wanted to talk about the fundamentals of cooking. And the whole thing is that, you know, they said, do, do a recipe video, do something that shows like your personality. And ultimately, like, for me, like, a big part of my personality, like, I love sketch comedy, I love writing, I love, like, film in all forms, you know, in, in whatever way it comes in storytelling, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so that was what I wanted to do is I was like, okay, I'll do a video, the sketch will be like, I'm just going to show everybody how to boil water, but it just, <laughs> but everything goes wrong. Like the, from the minute right. I, I start, it just, it completely like collapses into chaos. And so yeah. he wanted it to get to the point where like it cuts to black. It's like uh, getting up. I'm I, like, it's ears are ringing. It's like, it's the, the screen is all flushed. And I had to like, there's a version of the video that exists with that in it. But like for, so like I it guess gradually it, progresses to that, that point. Yeah. Of, like it gets of, yeah, to that your point. lowest. Yeah. 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 And it gets to a point of like where it's a little bit, and this is like, but this was something that was going out to like this, like orchestra in Toronto, like to their like followers of like people that are just like, you know, <laughs> sophisticated they want to go classy. Yeah. Well, they, they just want, yeah, they want to see like a Beethoven symphony. They want to like, uh, you know, see a piano concerto, you know, like they're, they're, they're like, but I, I get the impression, more. I get the impression it was so experimental, maybe avant-garde, like you're explaining that the target audience might not really understand or maybe yeah, yeah. get thrown off guard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so like, well, I can appreciate that. And I love that part of Joey and that's what makes so his filmmaking uh, style so unique. And so for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It wasn't like for that. And so I guess mm -hmm. in a sense, like, you know, like uh, <laughs> Joey's been, you know, like through and through a filmmaker his whole life, like since he was a kid, you know, right. and uh, it was, it just like, as our friendship grew and like, as a, uh, as like, you know, he introduced more to me, like over the summer, like uh, we, he really got me into David Lynch. Like he showed me a racer head, which I had never seen before. I still got to watch it. it. It's me oh too. man. You're in, you're in <laughs> yeah. for a, in for a in treat. For I know. It I is, have to give much love to David Lynch, man. I, I, yeah. I oh skipped over his filmography. It's so stupid of me. Oh, you, and, and, and also like twin peaks, an incredible, credible TV show. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, what he was able to do on network TV in the, in the nineties is, is, is amazing. Like it's, it's, yeah. it really opened the doors for a lot. And like what, what, you know, like that viewing, like really just was kind of like flipped a switch where like, not that, uh, you know, I didn't understand everything Joey was doing. It just kind of like brought me a little bit more into his world. And, and like, so I kind of, I guess, yeah, create is, he is really at the end of the day, like he's the person that has final say, it seems like, you know, and like also like a big part of our team, like uh, the three of us that like wrote on the new movie, um, I'm Corn Puffy and Ghost Camera was also like right. Noah Bonen. And so like, well, Joey is like a lot of the time the director and like kind of like the over overseeing everything, you know, like um, I'd like to think that, you know, like Noah and I are still very, very much involved in, you know, like things don't necessarily get signed off on without like us seeing it first a lot of the time. So, well, he is kind of like in somewhat more of a uh, creative control, at least in it from like the director's chair, you know. Um, as far as like uh, my main, you know, position in our like collaboration is, uh, you know, as a writer. Uh, yeah. But I also uh, take part in like a lot of the music making. Uh, I was just going to say with your with your background and especially you studying masters in music, I'd, I'd be using you. Yeah. For the yeah. score. <laughs> for the so, score. 
Yeah. yeah so like our I, he mentioned our friend Keshav uh, Sharma Jaitley who goes by like uh, who goes by Piari as the composer of the original score right, which is right, just like yeah. next level like it takes the film to, to a whole other height but like I was like so and Keshav is a very he I met him in uh, my undergrad at U of T um, and I introduced him to Joey actually and so the three of us are super close friends and um, so like I've been working directly with them you know like there's a lot of uh there's a lot of clarinet on the soundtrack, a lot of, you know, I, I like to think that I can bring like, you know, a caliber of, a, you know, of a, a playing that can like allow for a lot more experimentation and a lot more uh, range in what you can bring to uh, the sound design and to the music of, of our movies and stuff. Well, I, I really appreciate that. And I always, uh, I'm an advocate of that, uh, of music on my platform. I always discuss it with filmmakers and uh, I often joke if it wasn't for music, like if it didn't exist, <laughs> I wouldn't be in yeah. film because I think oh, yeah. it, it's not even like for telling us, it, it's crazy. Like you would think, oh, you know, for the love of telling stories, why wouldn't you want to be a filmmaker? It's like, no, like music takes it to another level. Um, oh, 100%. I don't, right. And like what you were saying, it taps into a different emotion. Uh, you know, I, I've watched films or uh, I, even my when I'm editing my work where I just do the bare bones because I'm trying to like get the skeleton of the project and there's like no music. And I become even miserable editing it yeah, because I'm like, yeah, this is yeah. so dry. It's boring. Like, I hate this project. Why did I write that dialogue? And then you inject music into it and it completely elevates the craft. And you're saying to yourself, wow, this is so transformative. And it becomes exciting too, right? Like yeah. I often explain my music uh, taste. Uh, I don't know if yours is different as well, but uh, you know, we live in a generation, most people our age, uh, it's more hip hop, R&B. Um, but I listen to all kinds of music, right? Like EDM, alternative rock. Um, because it inspires me uh, to write uh, pieces of dialogue, scenes, characters. Um, it just sparks something that uh, another piece of music otherwise wouldn't, right? Um, and a lot of people need to understand that, that, you know, music is, you don't have to like like a particular genre. You know, people like yeah. only listen to hip hop when you get into their car and it's just like nonstop yeah. on the Oxford. I'm you listening know, to literally brother, brother, like all kinds of music. <laughs> it has its place, you yeah. know, like I go through my phases, you know, what I listen to and like, there are times where like, I don't know if you've watched uh, Euphoria at all, but in the new season. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. There's a, there's a scene so where, like, where uh, Dominic Fike's character is like, uh, he's driving and is playing the new Baby Keem song, uh, Trademark USA. And yeah, it is like, of course. it is it is transcendent. It like, it, it just like takes it to an, I couldn't believe it. That, yeah. that show is just like next level. Like that scene, like the church scene in like episode four with like Labyrinth singing, like that, like injecting the person who composed the score for that show like like labyrinth has been like the soundtrack to like zendaya's character to rue throughout that entire series. oh yeah and for her to like get to a point you know where it's like that like she's like meeting it face to face it's like she is it's it's injecting music in that way just like takes it to another level it's like she's like transcended the show through into the creating into the making of her life which is like a tv show like it's it's the greatest like, episode like, it, it's show don't tell the, the, the golden rule of film right like the greatest yeah. episode in season two is when she was uh on drugs and she's running around the city um uh, like her neighborhood like yeah. very little dialogue and then when she does speak it's powerful but it's it's potent enough the fact that she's um in this uh you know dire state but the music like you said amplify the music's telling the yeah. story like yeah. it, you don't have to hear anyone speak you know what i mean and like you see it first... read her face and yeah Exactly. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And for like, I think that it just has so much like potential that can go untapped, you know? Um, I think like, it's really easy to kind of, you know, settle for like a score that's like, maybe like, you know, sad music that's like, you want this, you know, but like you can inject, like, like my favorite movies are the ones where like the sound design and the music are just like, like transport you to like, and especially a show like Euphoria, that's like so uh, soundtrack based like it's, it's yeah. like, there's a lot of original music but like a lot of it is like soundtrack by popular music and like it puts you in like like it it puts you in the place where they are you know it's like being in high school at this point like this is the music they're listening to this is like what's soundtracking their like what feels like you know at that time like the most important time of your life you know what I mean and like uh some of like my favorite filmmakers like um I, uh, I actually took a, a, a class this, this semester at school uh, the, through the history of film music with this guy, Mark Waters, who's like composed uh, a bunch of stuff with like John Williams and, awesome. uh, and uh, like hearing his perspective and like, we had to basically like pick a composer uh, 
for our final like paper, we had to like write a, a full uh, assignment report on like a, a composer and just like kind of go through and talk about their work. And like what I found like was the most interesting to talk about was, um, you know, filmmakers that work with, uh, with composers, almost like certain composers, like almost exclusively sometimes like um, Wes, Anders Wes Anderson's work with uh, Alexandre Desplat was just like the way that he injects music into his music and movies. He's so involved in the process. And it reminds me a lot of how Joey is with uh, our friend Keshev in the process of uh, music. Right. And, and like the way, like Joey's in the room with him, like we're, and, and Keshev is so talented. He is, he is one of like the most amazing musicians I've ever like have, have had, have had the privilege of knowing and like, let alone Amazing. being like such close friends with. And like, he sits down with Joey and they like go through the minutia, like adjusting, like just one note, like one, one second, you know, lining up, lining it's it up with a frame by like, like not yep. even a, like adjusting it by like milliseconds. So it just, it's just perfect. And like, like where it fades out, where it kind of soars, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like where it fits in, like with the characters and what they're saying and like what's happening. And it's, it's really like, it reminds me a lot of the way that like Desplat talks about working with Wes Anderson and that he is in the room and they have, they sit down and he is like, he says he's never worked with a director that's been more hands-on as Wes Anderson. And, you know, I don't know if you saw like the French dispatch, which was his newest movie that came out in uh, like December. Uh, Wes Anderson is another filmmaker. I really have to pay close attention to. Oh man. Yeah. 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 Cause like, no, cause his, his films are literally a work of art. Like they, they're yeah. all symmetrical um, every frame is calculated, you know, um, everything yeah. is, uh, yeah, on purpose. <laughs> oh yeah, ex yeah, exactly. That's what it is. Everything's on purpose and like yeah. everything works, to, like everything is an equal part that goes towards like whatever the story is, whatever you're trying, they're like these picture perfect like frames in which like absolute chaos and there's no rules, but everything kind of sits within this frame. And, you know, like the way that the, the music moves with the camera and the music moves like it's a part of what's happening. It's not like this exterior thing that's like meant to, you know, provoke a feeling like at, at its very core, that's what the music does. But like in, in his movies, a lot of the time, which is like what I think is, is like, I feel like he's a, a director and like a filmmaker that really takes advantage of music and uses it to its full potential. It's, it's like a part of every single, a part of the editing. It's a part of the, 100%. it's a part of the physical aesthetic of it and the, the visual aesthetic of it, you know, like it's a, uh, I, I really do think that like, uh, yeah, it's, the only, it's, yeah, yeah go ahead. sorry to interrupt. I just want to say the only filmmaker that comes close to that, uh, what you're describing is for me, Tarantino, like music, he, you know, takes it to another level, like the film. Um, so good. And so synonymous is something I discussed as a filmmaker is that when uh, a piece of music uh, belongs so well with a, a piece of film, you can't help but think of that scene or that uh, oh, yeah, dialogue totally. or that moment um, because like stuck in the middle with you, right? Forever ruined. I wouldn't say ruined. I said forever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, cemented uh, as the Reservoir Dogs cutting the ear scene, right? Like when I hear it, I heard it on a bank commercial yeah. uh, and they were trying to do some like, you know, fun kind of like upbeat vibe. And I just thought of like that sick, sadistic uh, scene, um, you know, that dark humor kind of thing, right? Um and it's just, that's what I mean. Like when, when a filmmaker knows what he's doing and he makes it synonymous, that's the goal. Like the new, back to what you were saying about like euphoria and how, um, you know, a, a show that's so very dark, gritty, melancholy can easily like, you know, steer away and lean into the whole like hip hop genre, R and B. Right. But they experiment with different uh, scores like Batman. Right. They yeah. were starting to play the last Batman in recent memory, the last Batman with Robert Pattinson, the Nirvana soundtrack, a song oh, that I never yeah, actually totally, heard before, yeah. but what I'm saying is that like they play it and I'm at first I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, wow, this like fits so well that when I hear it now, I just think of that scene where he's like, this is my city. And like, yeah, he's going yeah. through the seats and the shots. And I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. And that's why the film did so well, because it wasn't a studio uh, heavy handed kind of film. It was a filmmaker. It was an artist that said, I want to make it my way. Right. You could tell, you could yeah, tell it was, it was his own creation. Complete, yeah. It's a completely different direction from like any of the other like Batman movies. Um, I thought, yeah, it was really interesting. Like super like leaning into this kind of like grungy, like emo Batman, you know, it's like, it's a very, like he's been seen as this like crazy, this macho, like, you know, kind of like alpha dog, like. Yeah. Uh, guy. Playboy. And, and they, yeah. yeah. And like Robert Pattinson's character is like kind of this like lanky, like emo kid, you know, that is just like, it's still like, but it, you know, like it's, it's not to like that, to take that away from 
not that it takes away from Batman in any way. It's just like to be able to make that work for a character. It's like, yeah, like there's a, there's like a, but to have the balls, man, like think about that, to have the balls as a filmmaker to go that direction. Cause again, Batman isn't really viewed that way. If you look at the comics and if you look at, you know, how he's, how he's perceived in like, uh, you know, pop culture, He's always this big brooding kind of guy, right? And you're absolutely right. When yeah. I was watching at first, I was like, yo, why is this guy so emo? Like, is that like, isn't that <laughs> yeah. like, isn't that like early 2000s? Like, yeah, like that haircut are we out of that phase? Too. You know what I mean? Yeah. His and I said, the movie is nuts. <laughs> and it made so much sense because I always researched the movies I really enjoyed, um, like just how the creative process and, you know, what led to certain uh, creative decisions. And Matt Reeves explained, and it made so much sense that uh, Robin Pattinson was modeled after um, Kurt Cobain. Yeah, like yeah. he wrote him with him, him in mind. That's why his whole look, his posture, the hair, his yeah. attitude when he would talk to people. Like, yeah, I'm like, because I watched it a second time and I'm like, that makes so much sense. Like, yeah, why? Totally. Like, he, he established that um, with the soundtrack. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're saying with like the songs and stuff, like, it's really mm-hmm. like there are songs that will like make it into a film that are like so iconic that like filmmakers will stay away from that song for years because it became so synonymous with another movie. Like, I, I can't remember what it was recently. I think I was talking to Joey about it, like about the, the new P.T. Anderson, the licorice pizza. And, oh, I haven't um, watched that yet. That's oh, the, the last of my Oscar contender <laughs> I have uh, to watch. Unreal, unreal. So unreal, super, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, honestly, like one of my favorites of last year, like just, just an incredible, incredible movie. Like, Is it like a coming of age story? I always like those. Yeah, uh, it's in a way, sort of. It's, 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 okay. about, uh, it's about uh, a toxic relationship at, at its core. You know? yeah i had a feeling yeah and uh, but and, like uh, young lovers kind of thing like yeah, it reminds me of like yeah, yeah, adventureland like quirky yeah yeah like through the aesthetic of like the 70s and you know like growing up in that t- it feels got, really authentic you. to uh to what it is and also like explores like jewish identity in a really interesting way you know with like the the heim sisters i don't know if you know them as a band but like uh, alana heim who plays one of the leads uh right she she's a part of this band and her whole fan and like her, she, she and her sisters are obviously they're, they're Jewish and like her whole right. family, like her parents are in it, like her family plays her family in it. And so like, it's really cool that they bring that in, like, you know, like that meta feeling. Yeah. Of it. yeah. And in that movie, they, uh, they bring in, uh, like, uh, life on Mars, like the David Bowie song is like a big part. It's in the trailer. It's like, it's, it's a very big, like soundtrack moment. And I think Joey was telling me, I don't know if it was if it was if, if he watched like a pt anderson interview or something where like he talked about that it had felt like to don't quote me on this i i no 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 wrong, but sure. uh like how uh he felt that it had been like long enough since the last time uh a movie had used it and i think it was like the like the life aquatic uh the, that west that west anderson movie uh, with the like bill murray was, yeah yeah like yeah, that. Yeah. They, they used it in that and it's like that was in like 2007 or or something i that I could be wrong wow. about that too. I know it's like, early yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't know. It's like that years fact, and yeah. years, like years and years have passed. And it's like, it, it's like he, these moments, like almost need to like, when you can do that, when you can do that with a song and like that, it needs like over a decade to breathe before you feel like you can enter it into like, even like, even if I'm wrong about the movies and songs here, like the fact that that happens is, is like, that is what's so interesting to me. And like, are like, as much as like, like our, our movie birthright, like we, we, we joke, but it's serious that like, we would have loved to submit it to festivals and stuff because we're so proud of it. And, and we do think it's really good, but it's all filled with copyrighted music. Like it's all soundtrack. Uh, okay. Yeah. By copyrighted music, but the soundtrack is like so iconic and so integral to so many of the jokes. But it's and fitting. Stories. Right. Yeah, like you had, you had to pick that song. You couldn't pick yeah. something, like a, yeah. a like copyright movie, free one. Yeah, exactly. Like the movie yeah. isn't itself without like Mariah Carey's fantasy, you know, like that, like, and that, that's, oh, that's jokes. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, a, that that's is jokes. a song that's in it that like, I think like there's a whole scene we have to cut out of the movie without fantasy, like fantasy needs to be there. So like, hopefully the hope is, is that one day, you know, we manage to get something we make, you know, to be big enough, and to get enough funding that we can one day release birthright you know like with all of this music with this soundtrack you know yeah 100 percent. i would recommend i use artlist um because i was in the same position as you but it got to a point where it's like uh either videos were being taken down or festivals were yeah. telling me you can't we can't use this yeah so i said you know what if you can't beat him join him so <laughs> i said to my, like because i wanted the exposure right yeah, yeah um and artlist is a great site um that i've been using uh for the last two three years uh, and what I'm getting at is my recommendation would be 
you know, find similar uh, tracks uh, that might evoke the same emotion. And I'm sure you can accomplish uh, what you originally intended with the, with the film, you know, like I'm sure there's ways around it. It won't be probably the same. And I'm so happy you talk like that because you guys are true filmmakers, true artists at heart. If it's that song, it's that song. It reminds me of like Forrest Gump, the making of Forrest yeah, Gump. Yeah, Apparently yeah. they didn't have the budget for all that copyright because he uses a bunch of songs, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the guy was so smart. Uh, Robert Zemeckis, he goes, yeah, that's fine. No worries. Like he agreed with the studio's demands. He edited the film. He put all the soundtracks that he wanted. And yeah. he submitted it like to the, to the studio. Like this is because yeah. they want to see, right. The first draft or whatever. Yeah. And again, this is what I mean by when you do it right, you do it right. Uh, it's synonymous. You can't get it yeah. out of the head. Apparently all the tracks he used, which were in the final film, the studio executives were like, damn, we got to get the copy. We got to get yeah. the, the licenses for this because I can't now not watch it without it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. they smell it's, money. It's you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, I love those. A, I love those tactics, it. bro. Yeah, man. Yeah. And I mean, like our, our friend Keisha, like the thing with him too, is like, he can kind of emulate anything. Like, like if like Joey would sit down with like things that he wanted, like to be in, like to inspire certain uh, original pieces, you know, like, like uh, even like uh, one of the sat, one of the songs on the soundtrack for the new movie that um, Keisha composed, like uh, we joke that it's, it's like, uh, I, I play along to it and it's a, uh, it's like a klezmer which is like kind of like a Jewish jazz style thing in like the, which invoking like the theme music from the movie Fargo. I don't know if you've seen it, but like the- um, uh, Yeah, which, yeah like, which scene though specifically? Like or just like scene? the, the uh, like just like the main theme of Fargo. Like it's like, it's it, it, it in, it, it kind of in, is a little bit Fargo infused and like the title track like is like Jewish Fargo. Like that's the, the title for it for the movie. Okay. And so it's like, yeah, like, like Keshev is very good at like uh, finding ways, finding things like uh, making things similar, you know, that have their own original spin, you know, which is, which is honestly like in spirit of, you know, what like, uh, you know, like Corn Puff Records and everything that like, uh, you know, like the, I don't know if Joey talked a lot about like the, the idea of the post cover, but like in that way, like the, what like, Corn Puffians and like record labels like Corn Puff Records really explore is this new idea of, you know, the, the, the post cover and, you know, and, and in a way our soundtrack is kind of post covered in that a lot of the, the songs have been inspired by uh, already existing music, but with its own like unique personal taste by like us, you know, as, as uh, up and coming filmmakers and stuff. That's amazing, man. And, uh, you know, on the subject of music, I, I do have a question I want to ask you because uh, you just seem so, uh, you know, familiar with the plot, with, with the with the genre. I mean, with the art form, what kind of genre of music do you feel audiences should pay more attention to? Or do you feel like is there a genre that's lacking uh, for filmmakers or audiences alike? It's, it's an honest. That's a good question, because, like, I, I don't think that it's necessarily that there's like a genre that, um needs to be heard more but i think that like there needs to be maybe a little bit more openness it just in general to like what can soundtrack what you know like a little bit more oh like just a little bit more openness to everything because there's so much potential like i don't know if you saw uh, spencer the uh that came out last year with like kristen stewart um about uh, princess diana okay but it's a it's an incredible movie and the soundtrack is uh johnny greenwood who is like just obviously legendary um, he did like the soundtrack for Licorice Pizza also and like Power of the Dog and like he he's he's like been working and been involved in like it like in almost every best picture from this year at least but like even dating back but like what was so interesting about like his choices there is he chose to score a lot of um, a lot of scenes with like these like very intense like jazz combos which were like like very high up like a uh, like uh, up tempo like fast paced kind of like bebop like anxiety like almost like oh, really anxiety inducing yeah to like portray oh like a lot of like princess diana or kristen stewart's characters uh uh like kind of is this for spencer like, yeah for spencer yeah because yeah. i remember i watched a bit of it I, I i still have to sit down and watch it fully but i know exactly what you're saying like it was like din, yeah, din, like, din, din, din. like it was uh, anxiety inducing yeah yeah and so she's like Tightening going through like a very intense like like just inner turmoil and it's being, and you know, she's in this crazy big, like this palace that's so extravagant. And like, you know, you, you may, you might think, you know, uh, classical music, string quartet, you know, uh, harpsichord, like dinner party right. music, but like, 
it's it's like it's 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 melancholy kind of, it, yeah and it, and it and it's just anxiety it's it's it's, it's eerie breakdown, yeah you know yeah it's like and so and like to use jazz and that's like that's something i wouldn't think you know and so i think just like an openness to like the possibilities of what something can bring you know if you just allow you know yourself to experiment and open yourself up to stuff you might not necessarily have thought about and like even in in, in involving that in sound design as well like in 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 the way that like you transition from in from diegetic and non-diegetic music, I think can be super, super interesting. And like PT Anderson does that so, so well, you know, like in, in Magnolia, like the sound design of that movie is unbelievable. And I just think that like, maybe not putting up as many rules for ourselves or as many, like, yeah, I think, yeah, our boundaries for like, what can be considered, uh, you know, appropriate, whatever that means, you know, I think if we can just like, maybe open ourselves up to being a little bit more experimental, you know, maybe, maybe it's Joey's influence on me, but uh, I think that just, I think being open to, th to maybe genres that might not be as conventional for whatever type of movie you're trying to make can, you know, open up a lot of possibilities and like push forward, um, you know, the potential of what movies can be. Cause like movies can be anything, man. Like, and I think, there's no rules, man. Yeah, Creativity I, is experimentation in itself, right? So. Yeah, I don't know if you saw it. It just came out, but the everything, yeah. everywhere, all at once. The that new uh, movie from uh, the directors and writers, Daniels. Uh, it is that that movie showed me that more than anything. Like it was, it was in a, just like an unbelievable experience to see. If you get to see it in the theater, like I would suggest it. Like music and otherwise. Like I walked away from that and it was just like movies can be absolutely anything. I felt like I went through a time warp like the movie is two hours and 20 minutes i could not believe it was only two hours and 20 minutes i'd felt like i in the best way possible sat through like a 10 hour like just gargantuan like yeah uh, op magnum opus of these of these uh filmmakers you were just overwhelmed by yeah by the uh, vision yeah 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 the, the the vision exactly like and and there's this like this movie uh that i saw in in rochester uh it, it just got some really good coverage. It just got picked up at Sundance a while ago, like uh, okay. through this year's selections. And it's called Strawberry Mansion. And it was super, super low budget, but like it was, it had a super clear vision. And it's, it's kind of like, it, there, I can't even put it in a box in any way. And like you watching that, like I keep my eye out for that to watch that. I can't remember who, uh, what the, the filmmaker's name is. But yeah, Strawberry Mansion, it's it's like it's on video on demand. It's in some theaters around uh, the States. I don't know if it's made its way to Canada yet, but, uh, you know, the filmmakers from Rochester. And so I made it so they had it at this theater and like even without like an insane budget, like it seems like a movie like everything everywhere all at once had like it was just like this filmmaker created possibilities for themselves. They just allowed for whatever you know like playing with form you know using like things like miniatures you know like someone like Wes Anderson likes to use as well a lot in his movies like yeah I think that if we just kind of can recognize that there aren't as many rules or boundaries that we've put up for ourselves with music and with filmmaking in general that like we have the potential to like unlock a lot of like really really interesting art and a lot of really interesting stories that are told in a way that like you know you know, has people look within themselves, which is like what I love in movies is movies that kind of ask questions and make you, uh, you know, look inward in look in, inward. In and way. yeah, see, see life and life society, the, the world you live in, or like your city in a different way. Right. Um, yeah, and kind totally. of use that film as a reference point. That's always interesting. Even though in your head, you know, it's fake, right? Like there's actors, there's music, it's all uh, curated to, to make you feel something uh, tailored to make you feel something a certain way. Um, the reality is, is that the, the the tone, the message that it's delivering um, is predicated on real life experiences, right? Yeah, um, totally. And, and it's therapeutic in a way, right? Like you, how you can handle things differently and interpret the world. So yeah, I really definitely uh, believe that as well. Uh, music should never, should know no bounds. Uh, people should yeah. experiment with all kinds of genres. And if you do like hip hop and you can tell a great story with just hip hop, go ahead. Or if you could do yeah. it with uh, country, why not, right? Like Experiment with both seen, sides. Uh, have you seen Atlanta at all? On, uh, no FX. but people are telling me to that's yeah, your second like person that. to recommend it recommend Dude, it, yeah. atlanta is like is 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 a, is a generational tv show like it's a time that's going to wow. define like television in our like really in our time like, like people are okay. going to be talking about it like they talk about you know like the sopranos or they talk about breaking bad or they talk about like twin peaks you know like these are like and and that is a show that like 
that is soundtrack almost solely by hip hop. And it is, it is, it is amazing. It is the way that they use it. It's like, it's, it's a part of everything. It, it puts you in this world, you know, of uh, Paperboy, which is like the rapper that it's about. And it's like, if like, just like- Oh, is whatever, it about his, his life, by the way? Like- It's not about Donald it, Glover's life. Lucy's no, part? No. Oh, okay. No, it's not based on him or anything. It's, it's, it's more about like coming up as a, as a rap musician now, like what that's like in, it's not necessarily uh, his story specifically, but like his perspective and his, and Hiro Mirai and like a lot of the other uh, writers and people who are involved, like their, you know, experiences with like watching and, and being a part of like, uh, you know, hip hop coming up in this day and age, as like you were mentioning, like the main, like, you know, like the, the cultural, like musical moment right now, you know, like the, being the center of the cultural zeitgeist, like what that's like and how they navigate that. And like, yeah, it's just like whatever will tell that story. Like hip hop is what's going to tell that story. Hip hop is what's going to soundtrack a story like that better than any other genre, you know, regardless of what anyone thinks. So like, yeah, like it's, it's, if it tell, like, I think for music, it's just like lean into whatever's going to like create, set that scene and create that aesthetic and like that the, you want to present with whatever story. It's, it's just going to make it feel more true to itself and more true to you. And that's at the end of the day, what, people want to see like that, like that's the art that does the best. Those are the movies that like really uh, that like, you know, are, are critically acclaimed and not that that's everything, but like the movies that, you know, are seen as like classics are ones that a lot of people are like, are what's coming from within the filmmakers like and true to them, not like catering to a certain demographic or to a studio head specifically, or like certain people that are involved in the industry. It's more like, you know, the best stuff is the stuff that's coming from within the people making it, I think. Awesome, man. And well said <laughs> on, on terms of that uh, whole topic of music. Uh, it's something that should never be amiss, you know, like, uh, and that's why I always tell people on this podcast, uh, friends, collaborators, colleagues, uh, music is a very powerful art form um, that's been beautifully married uh, in, into film. And it goes hand in hand. You can't see one without the other. Um, yeah, so. Totally glad we agree on that uh, on that uh, subject so regarding now going back to like your collaboration with uh, joy litvak and your friend um what kind of projects do you uh personally wish to like strive to tell like what kind of projects are you uh do you desire to be be seen on the screen um i mean i i'm very happy uh writing i'm not so much you know, I think maybe, maybe I'd like to be a part of other, maybe I'd like to, I mean, I was, I was on screen for a lot of Birthright, the Birthright movie. It really is like, yeah. about, it's about me really. For sure. Yeah. I may not have I, been super comfortable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I may not have been super comfortable at the time, but like, I think I am, I mean, I love, love, love writing comedy. Like that's my favorite thing, making sketches. Like I've done like any, any sketch work I've done, um, I've like directed myself, which is like, that's where my like uh, experience in, in directing comes is in specifically like sketch stuff. And right. like it, in terms of projects, like I'd love to continue making stuff like Birthright and, you know, that kind of blurs this line of, uh, of reality and fiction in a way that like is funny, but is also like, you know, meaningful. And like at the end of the day, like as much as like Birthright is like a mockumentary, like it says a lot. And I think that it's like, it, it does a lot. It, it has a very, uh, there's a very emotional side to it and there's a very real uh, and personal side to it that I think, you know, like any, 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 uh, anything I'm making, whether it's film, TV, anything like that, like I, I, I think everything kind of, I don't see myself making something that isn't necessarily through a comedic lens all the time. Yeah. Like that's kind of like where uh, every, every movie can be a comedy. You know what I mean? Like even like, the, like ones that are not maybe necessarily i find myself laughing all the time you know oh it's true yeah well there's ones that are intentional unintentional but uh, you yeah. said it best and that's where I, my genre why people ask me like oh what film what kind of films do you make or strive to make aspire to make uh for me it's dramedies like i love yeah. like hard-hitting dramas but then you sprinkle in like a joke or an exchange or yeah uh dry humor dark humor like that that's it kind of like injects some like uh, life to it like humanity like the batman uh, i was speaking yeah. to you last about you wouldn't think of it as, as a comedy, but there are moments where you kind of chuckle, right? You, yeah, you laugh yeah. like there are people uh, commissioner theater, Gordon. Yeah. He's like, he's like, you know, he, after Batman, uh, he told him to give him, you know, throw a punch at him so he can escape the police station. 
the next scene it's like yeah next time when you put like you could hold back on the yeah, <laughs> on those yeah, punches yeah, and everyone was yeah. laughing and it's like you know that joke really didn't need to be made because it's a dark serious movie but yeah. you have to you have to inject some humanity in it right like that's all that's also in light of the character he's always been like that wisecracking not wisecracking but you know he had he had a lighter sense of humor than batman <laughs> that's yeah. what con- contrasted him yeah yeah and like i even like like David Lynch is one of the funniest people, one of the funniest filmmakers, I think. Like, oh, like, for sure. Yeah. Like he is like the way, like his, his movies are very, very like, they really push boundaries and they can be very like- Tongue in cheek? Like weird, you know, like they can be yeah, super yeah, weird yeah. and like and disturbing, like, like really disturbing, honestly. But the yeah. way that like, but then he'll just like input something, like the way that he'll have someone say something or the way that like none of the actors in the background ever move. They're just like standing absolutely still. Like- it's it's hilarious i find myself laughing through those movies that like really kind of dig into like the, the like the disturbing nature of like i don't know of, of like being a human in, in like western in the western world like there's a lot of really like messed up or, or like fucked up shit that's happening and like he's kind of finds the like absurdity in a lot of uh human nature you know and that right. and that can be really fun and so like yeah i mean in in terms of like making stuff about like the the kind of stories to tell it's like I was mentioning like you know the best stuff is the stuff that's the most true to the people making it and so like I guess I just like hope that like whether it's sketch comedy whether it's uh like feature films whether it's tv shows whether it's like documentaries like as long as like you know like I'm able to like put my voice through it in a way that's true to me and everybody that's making it you know you know like like Noah or Joey or Keshav like whatever like is coming through them and is the most true to them. Like, I think as long as we're like a part of this open process um, and this, and this open, like collaborative, uh, this open collaborative environment for all of us, you know, like I don't see, you know, how we don't make something that connects with a lot of people because at the end of the day, the stuff that you think might be like super niche or super specific to you a lot of the time, like, you know, humans are like similar, you know, we all are kind of going through this insane thing that is like existing. And, you know, there's a, we have a lot more in common than we think, you know, and uh, I think just kind of leaning into whatever's true to us and what's true to our stories and true to our lives, you know, like that's what is, what's gonna, is what we want to put out because that's what we know. And that's what we're going to make best, you know, authenticity, man. Like yeah. uh, speaking from the heart, the best stories, people always ask me, how do you write? And I'm like, well, I just write what I know, you know, like yeah, exactly. I just write what's, write what's what you interesting know. to me. That's what every yeah, writer exactly. says too. Every, yeah. every like filmmaker says, write what you know, like that's, yeah. that's what's going to get you the good stuff. You know, integrate themes and, uh, you know, uh, maybe experiment or push the boundaries a bit, but the core, like the emotional core of the story or, or the reason for why you're sitting down, uh, to write it in the first place, you have to, it has to be a story that, that, uh, strikes true to you and you've either experienced or, uh, you desire to experience. Um, it has to play on that because yeah. people will pick it up. People will pick yeah. it up if you're authentic or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? People also pick up what, yeah, when you're not like people, like, yeah. like, I think that some people really think people are stupider than, than they are. Like, I yeah. think that people really underestimate yeah. audiences and really underestimate, you know, the people that would be viewing stuff, but like, I'll, like we can all tell, when something is like, I don't know, when it, when it, when it's when it's kind of empty, you know, like we're like not, void, yeah, it, like void we're, of something that's true to people, like for sure, like we're not Sicilian gangsters, but like we know if a movie's uh, not true to the genre, like not authentic in the way they yeah. speak, right? Yeah. Like if I watch a Scorsese Goodfellas, it's like yeah, I buy it. These guys are yeah. are, are mobsters, right? Or if I watch yeah, The Godfather. Yeah. Right. But if I watch like, you know, Gotti with John Travolta, yeah. right. Yeah. I won't, I won't buy it. Right. Like, it's just like, that's just not how they talk. Right. Um, now, whether the writer, it was a former gangster or not, that's the yeah. illusion. The point is, is that, like you said, it's about being authentic. And those guys, like through, I should, yeah. they grew through up with like lens. Scorsese. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah Scorsese yeah. was around that, that environment. So that's how he picked up the dialogue. Um, but even, even that, that's like what I mean by like talent and like, uh, going back to why you want to tell that story there, there was, it's not because it's hot at the time. There's an inclination, like you, you're, you're mesmerized by that culture, yeah. right. Uh, yeah. by that society you don't want to be, and you want to reflect trends. It. Yeah. yeah. Like following trends and just following like what you think is going to be the next thing is just going to lead to your downfall because you're never going to yeah. have anything to like grab onto. Like you're always going to be just like, it's like an endless river that you're just flowing down, trying to like grab onto rocks you know, like down these rapids when it's like, you're, you can't like, there's, if there's nothing that's like there, that's grounding you in your art and in 
like what you're in, in what you're like investing your time and your, and your life into, like, if there's nothing there, that's real, like you're not going to grasp it at all. Like it's going to be a miss every single time, you know? Yeah. So like, no, a hundred percent, man. Yeah. And, uh, well said again, <laughs> like, you know, you're on the right track too, as a filmmaker. And I really like, uh, your mindset um you enjoy like uh very rare very uh fortunate that you guys kind of like found each other as friends first but also uh now as collaborators um yeah as creatives right like you guys see eye to eye on what makes a great film but also uh what you should stay true to uh in yeah. making one right that's i think that's so important and that you guys don't butt heads right um yeah so i mean we we love a lot excited. of the same stuff like we love a lot like I, like we love movies and like jo joey's been more into it than I am for a lot of his life, but like, like that's at the end, it's just a love for movies. It's a love for, for film. It's a love for TV. It's a love for, you know, for, for, for anything within this like art form, you know, that's, that's where it all stems is, is, is love, you know, a love for and, it. Uh, as, and for me, like, you know, I took a master class, Martin Scorsese, and he said it best. Um, Cause that's a, it's a dilemma I've experienced uh, my whole life. And that's essentially going to film school. And he kind of clarified that before the film, the master class and said, you know, if you're looking to be uh, a director, you know what I mean? Or if you're looking to um, uh, have it as a career, um, don't take this class. Uh, but if you're looking to tell a story and you have this undying passion uh, burning inside you, this might be, th then I might be saying something uh, right to you. And when I heard that, I said, that's exactly it. It's like people yeah. think, like everyone wants, especially parents, it's like, well, what are you going to do with your life? Right. And it's like, well, yeah. this is all oh, I want to yeah. do, like filmmaking but they don't see it as a job and they're right. Like, I don't see it as a job either. For me, it's like, this is just a call to action. Like I need to do this. Like there's stories in my head. There's stories I've written. There's stories I've discussed um, whether they're in short form content or their feature film screenplays that I really believe um, need to be shared with the world. And I think that conviction, that compulsion, compulsion uh, to do it uh, is what's going to push me or any filmmaker alike uh, toward it. So yeah, totally hundred percent, man agreed like it's it's it takes up you know like for even pursuing the arts in music as well like it's it's it takes doing something like this and like trying to pursue any like like fine art you know it takes over your whole life and if you don't love it you're going to be absolutely miserable and it's not to say that like just because you love it you're not gonna like be miserable sometimes and you're not gonna like you know be frustrated and like, oh yeah and want to and want to quit because like that's just a part of it but like you have to be like to, in order to put in that time that it takes like you you can't hate you can't not have it be a part of you or else like you, you yeah you'd be miserable it would not be fun you would not want to do it and like it wouldn't and you wouldn't be making good stuff either you know so like that's just the way it is you know it's it's for some people it's it, it isn't for others and you know either way that's okay but just like being accepting of, of what it is being accepting of what is that that's all it is you know like you know yourself trust in it and uh hope that like uh, you know the path leads you uh where where it needs to take you 100 percent. well on that note thank you so much zach goldstein for coming on the podcast and sharing uh your insight uh your creative wisdom uh all you've all you've achieved so far uh with your fellow collaborator and close friend joey Livvac. Uh, I really mean that, man. It's very inspirational, you know, that brotherhood. Um, and that's something that we can all aspire to have, um, you know, having close contacts, people we trust, people we love uh, surround us uh, that make us not only, you know, good people, but better collab, better uh, creatives, better filmmakers. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Great to talk to you and catch up again, you know? Yeah, for sure. And like I told Joey um, in the future, let's, uh, let's get a collaboration going. Uh, I would love to learn from you guys and, um just work together uh yeah, any which way that we man. can all right sounds all right, good man. so thanks again everyone for listening and we'll talk soon